Um, so this is the foreign policy, our okay, foreign policy, a critical look at Canada's role abroad. And I am uh, Eve Engler coming to you from Georgiage, which has long been a meeting place of various First Nations, otherwise known as Montreal. And um, so uh, starting this week, lots of developments. I'm going to try to get uh, finish a little earlier if possible. Um, first thing, uh, Journal de Montréal had a story. This is the warmest, wet, uh, warmest winter on, uh, on record here in Montreal. Um, the climate crisis is barreling down quickly, and Canada is a major contributor. There's a story in the Financial Times titled The Threat of Regional War Intensifies as Congo Rebels Close in on Capital of Mineral, mineral Rich Area. And it's about the fighting in the east in Goma in, uh, by the Rwandan forces. And as I've mentioned repeatedly, Canada is backing Kagame uh, despite repeated horrors in, in eastern Congo. And Kagame still has significant support within the Canadian establishment. And uh, in fact, the Trudeau government has been uh, keen to even deepen that relationship. There's a story about, I think it was in the business section of the uh, Globe Mail, a uh, barrack mine shuts down after finding uranium. And a uh, barrack gold mine in uh, Zambia, um, uh, they found significant uranium contamination. And apparently the workers of the mine site had been drinking from the water. And barrack basically seems to have like, um, uh, basically concealed the fact that they were possibly or probably uh, poisoning themselves by drinking, drinking the water. And when uh, one of the union officials uh, challenged the company when this comes out, they fire him. He'd been working there for 11 years and now there's a, there's a legal battle. Um, but another example of, of the ecological damage came mining company and uh, in this case also bad uh, labor uh, practices. Uh, Evan Dyer, CBC, posted online on Twitter that the photos <clears throat> appear to show Canadian soldiers on the roof of the Canadian embassy in Port-au-Prince, that those uh, photos are circulating in, um, in uh, social media, Haitian social media. And that's not a surprise. We know, of course, in the, the night of Aristide removal in February 29, 2004, JTF secured the airport. There was also photos of Canadian Special Forces uh, about three years ago when there was major protests against Jovenel Moise uh, and there were four, four Canadian, presumed Canadian Special Forces, uh, uh, videoed at the Toussaint Louverture airport. And the story was is that they were helping the family of Jovenel Moise get out of the country amidst this uh, general uh, strike. I reported on it. Uh, Haiti Information Project found the video. I, I reached out to a, a corporate uh, military journalist to ask who they thought they were. And he said two of them were JTF, two of them were the other uh, uh, CANSCOM, the other Special Forces Command. Um, uh, but uh, no, not, nobody else in the dominant media reported on it. So just this whole idea that Canadian forces can go to um, Haiti kind of like whenever they want and we don't know about it, is uh, in and of itself quite dubious. And uh, it also speaks to just the, the ease in which Haitian sovereignty is, is violated. And of course, this is all in the context of lots of stories about the idea that there may still be a U.S. military intervention. And of course, they're trying to lobby to have uh, uh, Kenya take, take control of a U.N. mission or a uh, Pseudo UN mission, I guess, is probably the better term for it. On Friday, the Globe had a piece about uh, a um, the tenth Canadian that's confirmed killed in Ukraine, and the story was was pretty interesting. There's a bunch of details, and they were interesting. They quote a number of other Canadians who are fighting in Ukraine. They talk about this guy. He he led up this this uh, the Norman Brigade. Apparently, is like these far right, uh, very much associated with the far right. They went right to the front early on, and apparently they got 
um there's lots of backlash because they kind of they got and they basically got i guess they got killed or some of the people got killed um so the story goes into some of these details it, it, it talks about how you know the russians use this unit for their propaganda purposes because they're associated with the far right this guy this canadian soldier he'd been in the canadian military who who, who was killed uh in the early 2000s he then fought in the french uh, foreign legion and uh, and he headed up this unit in, in in Ukraine and then has just recently been killed. Um, that this guy that that the Russians really sort of used as a sign of the mercenaries and far right. Um, so it confirms that there still are significant numbers of Canadians uh, fighting on the ground. The the issue the story the situation in Ukraine is 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 is, is, is sort of get it gets less media attention but it it continues to simmer in a way that's very dangerous. The Russians have announced this is now, now they're at war. So they're taking that one step further. I mean, of course we're at war, but this is somewhat of a rhetorical shift and, and a sign that the, they're, they're doubling down. There was a missile reportedly that the Russians launched at, at Lviv in the, east, uh, in the west of Ukraine. And apparently it entered into Polish territory I don't know if that's true, but but that's what the polls are claiming. And that, of course, l- leads us down this escalatory dynamic. And we know that um, that uh, the, the French president has been talking about sending, formalizing, sending French troops. So this the escalatory dynamic is really, it, it, you know, continues to be a serious uh, uh, concern. And yet. As as uh, uh, Pitasan, uh, who who did a very good series on on uh, documentaries on Canadian foreign policy, he interviewed. I think I mentioned this last week. Bob Ray, Canada's ambassador to the UN, and he he posted just uh, I think yesterday. He said, "I asked Bob Ray, given the enormous death toll the Russian Ukrainian war has taken and the increasing threat of nuclear confrontation, whether Canada would call for a diplomatic solution to end the war." His response: "You're kidding." So two years later, Canadian officials continue with this sort of total dismissal of any of any effort at negotiation, still doubling down. And there's more and more and more images. Uh, the University of Ottawa professor uh, Kachanowski posted this, uh, uh, I think it was earlier today or yesterday, of from his where he's from in a very uh, nationalistic part of Ukraine. And how women in the community are resisting the efforts of taking the men off to fight. So even in the very nationalistic parts of the country, there is a reluctance to to, um, have more sons or husbands go off to to kill and to be killed. Um, And uh, it really is a situation where there's people like Bob Ray who seem totally comfortable with fighting to last Ukrainian. Uh, that's the the likely uh, increasingly likely scenario, and they don't certainly don't want to admit that. And um, when there's fairly limited cost to Canada, they they seem uh, fine to uh, push Ukrainians uh, down that uh, path. The Ottawa Citizen Puglesi had a piece that said uh, military wants more ability to plan to launch uh, uh, cyber attacks. So the military wants to deepen its um, latitude to participate with the communication security establishment in offensive cyber attacks, not just defensive. Right now, the the new legislation, they have ability to engage in offensive cyber attacks with the OK of the defense minister, I believe it is. They want enhanced uh, powers to just sort of do what they want on that front. And that's clearly where we're going. Uh, and I think that the whole uh, China NATO proxy war dynamics are 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 are, are um, strengthening that kind of push within the Canadian military and the Canadian political class. But I think that realistically, these cyber attacks that the military wants to be have greater latitude to participate in, realistically, that's probably going to be more uh, focused on countries like Iran and or maybe like a Venezuela or or other countries that are that are probably a bit weaker 
than um, China and uh, and and Russia. Um, <clears throat> the Wall Street Journal published this piece. And we're seeing this more and more in the Canadian media that we have to cut social programs to fund this increased military spending. And so the, the title of the piece was Europe's social spending likely faces cut. And they quote the Lithuanian foreign minister who says openly, you have to rearrange the social contract, right? The social contract of pensions, of daycare, of welfare, et cetera needs to be cut in Western Europe and in Europe in general to fund more military spending to prepare for war with Russia. And they're, they're saying it openly. And that's, of course, a uh, terrible uh, development. On, uh, on the China file, um, the Wall Street Journal published a piece saying that Huawei spotlights the limits of U.S. power. And basically saying that the big effort of the U.S., Canada to kibosh Huawei's rise was successful, but only partially. And that Huawei has been able to um, reboot itself, figure out selling in international markets, uh, uh, displacing Apple with a new, a new uh, phone in the Chinese market, a new, apparently it's, you know, very cutting edge. Um, and um, and so the Americans have succeeded at one level, but in fact, the company's basically been able to been able to plow through and and uh, and have some uh, success. So that's kind of an interesting, I think, has a quite significant geopolitical um, uh, questions to it. The Toronto Star, I was in Ottawa, so I had the opportunity at the Toronto at the Ottawa Library on uh, Thursday to read to read some back issues of the Toronto Star. And they published a piece titled um, Protect Data from Chinese... In uh, sorry about that. Uh, there's uh, five kids five kids in the house right now. Um, and so the story titled Protect Data from Chinese Influence. And it was uh, Charles Burton from the McDonald Laurie Institute. Again, this is the Toronto Star, the most left-wing, liberal, whatever, uh, newspaper in the country. English language, newspaper of the country. It says, quote, when Chinese investors acquire foreign companies, they're opening a door for spying. In every Canadian business bought by Chinese money, Beijing establishes a Chinese Communist Party committee operating in Canada. With every acquisition, the reach of Chinese intelligence service services expands. Those Chinese police stations operating in Canada we're just the tip of the iceberg. This is absolute insanity. So every time a Chinese company buys a Canadian company, it's uh, it establishes a Chinese part, Communist Party committee in Canada, operating in Canada. I mean, this is the level of of like you know right under right out of the McCarthyite time, and this is what's being published on the op-ed page of the Toronto Star in the in the China threat. On in the Journal de Montréal. They're continuing this really aggressive. They're, they're taking up the baton from, from the Globe and Mail, really aggressive anti-China uh, uh, kind, of, kind of policy or, or, or coverage. And they have a piece that says, titled is Rencontre gênante pour le ministre François-Philippe Champagne a été, um, uh, été invité, invité par une collègue qui défend les présumés. Uh, so it basically, François-Philippe Champagne Met, met with the elected official at a fundraiser, at a, at a, a 30 person or so, a Liberal Party fundraiser. The elected uh, official in, um, on the city council in um, one of the uh, Montreal suburbs, who's accused of uh, being in, in, or who is in charge of a community association that, that is accused of having Chinese uh, police stations uh, based in it, which they of course deny. She launched a big lawsuit against the RCMP as I've discussed in previous uh, sessions. This person was invited or came, it's, I'm not totally clear, uh, to this event where the industry minister was participating. And so this is according to Journal de Montréal, a big scandal. Uh, but like, again, she's an elected official. She's got a long history with community groups. 
uh, all that is out there is this accusation that that there's very little evidence presented that there was a Chinese uh, police station set up in this community center. There's two different community groups that this is accused of. One of the which is 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 I I you know I know somebody who was the the former head of it, and um, and uh, and uh, it seems very dubious uh, uh, to me. But according to Journal Moraz, a big scandal. They have a couple articles about it. They quote this uh, official saying it's unbelievable that they 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 this is basically that the MP that invited the the um, well that invited I guess the minister and invited this. This a Chinese Canadian who's you know accused of leading a community association. She's an elected official leading a community association that Chinese police stations. They're saying that this is like an intervention in the police uh, um, investigation. Uh, anyways, so it's it's quite the uh, quite the uh, um, uh, scandal. Now the Globe published a couple of pieces about these the Winnipeg. Um, uh, scientists at this lab with cutting edge Canadian uh, sort of biosecurity type lab. Um, and that has obviously been playing out a lot. And they're saying these two uh, scientists have connections in China. Well, th they're from China. One actually grew up, only came to Canada not that long ago. Um, they're saying they have uh, connections with, with officials from the Chinese government, officials that have that you know, either, uh, either part of or tied to the Chinese military. Um, big long stories in the globe. Uh, two, I think it was two uh, Monday, uh, Tuesday and Wednesday or whatever Monday or Tuesday. I forget. Front page long stories. I read through them. It, it does seem like there is evidence here that there is this um, was clearly a connection with China. Uh, I don't. There was no denying that this person was doing lots of research in China and collaboration with Chinese scientists. Um, the claim is that they they went to the Wuhan lab and they didn't they didn't uh, they didn't uh, report that and there's sort of like some kind of like a nefarious uh, lack of reporting by the by at least one of the scientists. Um, it, it's 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 all it's, it's hard to really sort of get a get a you know handle on it how um, legitimate it is. Um, uh, but they're they're you know making this as a huge story and Parliament is like resitting or the the committee is resitting, I believe, this week when Parliament's not on to investigate uh, this whole question further. And they're saying that now they're they're now in China, though they're they've never been, they haven't been charged with anything. They still have houses in Winnipeg, and they're, but they're now in China working, and they they're working under under pseudonyms. And this is this is considered confirmation of this the fact that they're they're really sort of. They're kind of implying spies for China, but then they sort of say, well, not really spies, but maybe, maybe sort of just collaborating with some, with some, uh, um, you know, weapon or potential sort of uh, you know, viruses or whatever as weapons or that kind of, that kind of stuff. Um, you know, it's real. That, that domain is real. I, I, I've written about it. You know, Canada has a long history of uh, kind of bioweapons and stuff like that. We, it doesn't get talked about it much, but that, that is something that we obviously should be taken taken seriously, um, but it's not clear to me how how um, how legitimate this all is and how much of it's all part of the the China uh, uh, hype. Um, shifting gears, there was a um, comic, a cartoon, should I say? that was posted on um on um i don't know if everyone can see that uh i could blow it up here maybe a bit i gotta blow this up a bit um it's a caricature of of uh netanyahu and it says it's on route to rafa and it's titled nes nos 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 for nahu uh, which is the um, the vampire, uh, I guess, Dracula, not, not, I forget what, what he's actually called. Anyways, this is comic was published by a very prominent Quebec cartoonist in La Presse. I think it was on Thursday. And immediately, the, the, um, the uh, Israel lobby forces had a huge kerfuffle 
and said this was like anti-Semitic and pretty quickly La Presse withdrew the comic. Now, personally, I see no problem with this comic. The idea that Netanyahu can be caricatured as a vampire uh, amidst what is going on in Gaza, I think is totally reasonable. Um, I do not see uh, some, some um, reference to a century old uh, Nazi uh, uh, de uh, demonization of Jews. I see the prime minister of Israel who's engaged in bloodletting at a level that is stunning being caricatured. And I, and I think that this is a big courageous move of this comic of our cartoonist to uh, publish this. And I believe that it's actually uh, deeply anti-Palestinian to make a kerfuffle about this. Now, former independent Jewish voices communication lead, Aaron Lakoff, in response to this comic or after the Israel lobby got it, got a kerfuffle going, he said, quote, this caricature in La Presse is anti-Semitic. Full stop. Now, he has some like preamble about how the Israel lobby um, exaggerates claims of anti-Semitism. Uh, but this is a legitimate claim is kind of the preamble. It's a, it's a five part uh, um, uh, tweet where he gets into different elements. Here. Now, he says that it's, it's anti-Semitic for two reasons. One, that it's, it, it suggests blood libel. And two, because uh, Netanyahu's nose is enlarged. And that's playing to a, to a, um, a stereotype of, of Jews. Now, if you look at the uh, Chap uh, 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 Chapeau, I forget his exact name, the, the Quebec com, com, uh, cartoonist, if you look at his other cartoons, everyone has a big nose. I, I didn't search like deep in, but I looked at a number of them. They, like Legault has a huge nose. Actually, if anything, Netanyahu's nose is being kind of like under-exaggerated compared to his, what seems to be his norm. Um, and it's also not in, in a, what would be the stereotypical, uh, like hook nose kind of um, um, anti-Semitic sort of, sort of uh, depiction. Okay, so, but he says that, and he references, Lakoff references his personal experience of being mocked for having a big nose when he was a kid. Um, when, when, when saying that, so you just don't, don't ever have a cartoon, um, don't ever have a caricature of a Jewish person with a big nose, is what he says explicitly. Which is essentially, in this case, you're almost saying you can't caricature uh, Jewish figures. Um, that seems pretty extreme to me, but that's his position. And, and like I said, the blood libel. Now, if you believed that this cartoon was playing to a stereotype around uh, exaggerating Jewish noses, and that in some way it, it um, exacerbated a prejudice, like a century old prejudice of, of Jews as vampires, kind of like a, you know, it, it stoked that. Um, if you believe that, Okay, I do not, but let's say you believe that. To me, it would still be outrageous, outrageous amidst this horror in Gaza to say the damage done to Quebec or Canadian Jews by that, by that, uh, again, I don't, I reject this depiction, but if you agreed with this depiction of this, of this playing to Jewish stereotypes, that the, that would supersede the value in having a mainstream publication in Canada. Let's be clear. There aren't any cartoonists in the country putting in hardline uh, uh, critical depictions of the Israeli uh, prime minister as he kills and kills and kills. The value, the upside of having that in La Presse far supersedes. Anybody who has an, an ounce of internationalism or humanism would understand that far supersedes any possible, again, I don't believe this is going on, but even if you did, uh, 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 spillover onto Quebec or Canadian Jews. So to me, this is absolutely outrageous. Now, now why this is important is because Independent Jewish Voices immediately retweeted Aaron Lakoff. 
their former communications lead. They retweet it. And that had the effect. There were many people online um, basically saying, this is an anti-Semitic. This is depicting the Israeli prime minister engaged in committing a Holocaust and depicting him rightly. And uh, and many people pointed out, and I think correctly, this is being, you know, this is, it's vampires that have, have the right to be complaining here. Uh, this is, you know, to, to depict Netanyahu as a vampire is is really mean to uh, uh, to vampires. Um, so independent Jewish voice is coming out in this way uh, and um, had a very damaging impact on on how it was how others responded in in rejecting. It kind of undercut those like pushing back against against this whole once again. Now the. Uh, um, Alexandre Bourris, the only NDP MP in Quebec, he he tweeted out about how this is a the character. I'm, I'm translating it quickly. The character in La Presse, uh, now uh, withdrawn, was highly problematic and anti-Semitic. It should never have been published. In this tough times, we need to be uh, uh, not not enhancing uh, uh, racial hate, essentially. Um, then Jagmeet Singh retweeted it. Uh, Canadians for Justice and Peace in the Middle East retweeted the Aaron Lakoff thing that IJV uh, uh, retweeted. And then actually CJPME tweeted out two more statements that attacked um, uh, the comic, to my, to, in my opinion, to their utter shame. I put more of the blame here on IJV because they're the ones who, who, put, who got the ball going. And because, and this is where I, this is, I think it has a broad political point that becomes important here. IJV has developed, independent Jewish voices, has developed um, a, a significant uh, influence within the pro-Palestinian world. And they become somewhat of the kind of like the barometer uh, within the sort of official pro-Palestinian world of like what becomes anti-Semitic and what's not anti-Semitic. They effectively play that function, whether that was their intent or not, that doesn't really matter. That is the reality. And people in IJV should know that full well at this point. And now IJV, of course, is divided on this, right? Larry Haven, longtime IJV member, published a piece basically saying, no, I don't think this is anti-Semitic and goes through it. And people can read it. It's a big, long piece. Pretty good piece. Personally, I think he really underplays um, the most important point, which is that even if you believe this was this was in some way, you know, we, we have referenced uh, historic stereotypes, even if you believe that, the upside of having something like this published in this context of horror beyond belief in Gaza, this upside is so much surpasses any of that. And quite frankly, the business of, of centering Jewish sensitivities that Lakoff and IJV are doing uh, in this case is deeply, deeply anti-Palestinian. And they have to know that people who believe in justice feel that way. They have to know there is a lot of pressure. I got emailed in response to putting this into the 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 um, um, uh, the alert for this uh, Canadian Foreign Policy Hour. I got emailed by a friend, by a friend saying, "Don't talk about IJV publicly. Not a, not somebody from IJV. Don't talk about publishing. This is damaging. This is should have been discussed in house." I reached out some people in IJV before. I, I emailed some people in IJV to raise this matter. Um, uh, but uh, uh, this is not, we have to understand that if a group only receives pressure from B'nai B'rith, from, from Sija, which obviously IJV receives endless pressure from that direction, if they only receive pressure from one way, well, which way are they going to bend? I mean, come on. This is, this is politics 101. So th this business of like, you can't, that the, the pro-Palestinian world can't push back. Like the idea is like you can't go public with it. You can't say this public. They put it on Twitter. They put it on Twitter. They put it on Twitter, but you can't go public responding to it. I mean, that's nonsense. That's absolute nonsense. Um, so this stuff, this stuff needs to be it needs to be pushed back. Again, I th this is a line. We're not, I'm not walking away from these smears, right? Jagmeet Singh's smear of the Spider-Man protest a month ago. We're not just letting it slide. No more, no more letting it slide. Personally. I think there should be a letter writing campaign, a public letter writing campaign, demanding that IJV and CJPME withdraw this from their Twitter and apologize. 
This is an anti-Palestinian smear amidst a Holocaust taking place in Gaza. And I think they had, people have to completely understand that. Now, the, tied into this, and so on Friday, I um, uh, Jagmeet Singh was speaking here actually half a block from where I live at a community center. So I went there and Alexandre Bourris was there. I knew Bourris would be there. Um, and, and I challenged Bourris on his uh, criticism of this cartoon. And, and the point I was trying to make, so I was trying to challenge him on this criticism of the cartoon, but I, tied to that, I asked him a question if he'd been to any of the demonstrations, uh, 25 weeks in a row, 25 weeks in a row of mass demonstrations against the genocide in Gaza. And I asked Bourris if he'd been to one of those. Not one, okay? This is a left-wing MP. I have seen Bulris at immigrant right. I've seen him like uh, solidarity across borders, right? Like, like you know, what some consider very radical kind of like, you know, abolish all borders kind of stuff. I've seen him at poverty demonstrations, I've seen him at many climate demonstrations, I've seen him at many demonstrations. Not one of 25 weeks in a row of mass demonstrations. The biggest one, about 50K, uh, the smallest one, about 600, almost every single other one, over a thousand, many in 5,000, 10,000, 3,000, 15,000, et cetera. Not one of those demonstrations. And that universalizes across the country. None of these left-wing MPs. Okay, Jag, uh, uh, Jagmeet Singh was here in, in Montreal on Saturday. He went to Brian Mulroney's uh, a funeral at 11 a.m. I'll get to that maybe later, but he didn't go to the 5,000 person Palestine demonstration organized by unions, by a huge swath of Quebec civil society, not, not the radical Palestinian youth movement, but very establishment left Quebec. He didn't attend that. Okay. Um, uh, and he hasn't been to any, and none of the NDP MPs. So why the NDP MPs and, and left representatives don't attend these demonstrations is for a very simple reason. It's because they're going to get smeared. Matthew Green attended one of the demonstrations for a month in, and he was he was smeared. He had to put out a statement saying, I disagree with what somebody somewhere at the demonstration said that might have hurt some Jewish person's feelings, da, 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 whatever. OK, and it's the anti-Semitism thing. So you have a situation where you have the establishment on on behind behind Israel. But on top of that, you have this unique stick that that you can smack on people that that basically identifies the justice minded as being, uh, you know, associated with the ultimate evil, i.e. the Nazi uh, uh, Holocaust. And so when when uh, Alexandre Boris smears a cartoonist, when IJV smears a cartoonist, when Jagmeet Singh smears Spider-Man for Palestine demo a month ago, where a guy stands up with a Palestinian flag on a hospital that a hundred years ago had some association with, you know, has a Jewish association, this all contributes to why people in positions of authority and influence do not show up at the demonstrations, why cartoonists don't want to take on the issue. And it's this whole cycle of our self-marginalization. And here you have IJV and CJPME reinforcing that marginalization of the Palestine solidarity world that they themselves say they are you know, central to. Um, uh, so we need to call this out. We need to talk about it. And, and we need to push back. We need to push back. We don't have to back away. We don't have to be, oh, that has to be quiet. We don't want to talk about this quietly. We don't have the back room kind of business. This is made public not by me. This is made public by those who post it on Twitter. Um, so, so I think that that's a really important dynamic that needs to be referenced. Um, now, on the Palestine question, on the Palestine question, there was a, a very significant development, uh, which I think was a, a fascinating development, which was, of course, the House of Common Re Commons resolution uh, a week ago, late onto Monday night, it passed. We talked about it a bit last week, and it passed late Monday. And I think, you know, this was, the resolution was way too small from the NDP, and it was drastically watered down. So it was something that wasn't that good, watered down to something that was even worse. But having said all that, I think it's a step forward. You know, things like Palestine recognition were dropped, um, which I think is is obviously a bad thing, even if that gets into some interesting discussions on that question. Uh, the ar the arms thing was watered down. Okay, the language, they, they it was much stronger language, and the liberals were able to water that language down. 
and that's all uh, clearly like on purpose, right? The liberals are playing like a totally dirty game with, with uh, denying how many weapon sales and the language and legalistic, this and that, whatever, you know, people are calling for an arms uh, embargo on permits. And they're saying, well, no new permits, right? We, they apparently have 315, according to the Maple, they have 315 active permits for arms exports to Israel. Um, so of course, you know, no new permits has quite significant uh, implication versus just no permits. Um, uh, so that's uh, uh, relevant. Then there's also Brent Patterson has a good piece in uh, in uh, um, uh, a PBI. I'm uh, um, totally forgetting the name of the group right now. Um, about the Colt Canadian. Uh, uh, it's titled "Could Canadian Made Colt M4 and M18 MK18 Assault Rifles Be Exported for Israeli Civilian Security Squads?" And it basically saying that they, they bypass it through the U.S. Okay, so the the the, the arms exports will go through the U.S. Now. Stop War has a good um, uh, graphic that kind of helps get our head around, head around like what this whole arms permit business is and like what a real arms embargo is. So, so they, they say it's titled Steps to Enact a Full Arms Embargo. And first one is commit to stop approvals of military export permits to Israel. And that's what was won in that motion House of Commons. But then they list a couple other things. Publish a policy update suspending all new export permits to Israel on Global Affairs Canada website. That has yet to be done. Stop the transfer of arms that were already approved for export to Israel. That of course hasn't been hasn't been done. And we, it's unclear where they're gonna what they're gonna do with some of the outstanding permits. Uh, close the loopholes by banning weapons going to Israel via the US. Okay. Make the arms embargo two ways by stopping the purchase of weapons from Israel. So the Canadian military purchasing weapons from from Israeli companies. Or, or I guess even the Israeli military. So, so that's what we need to be pushing for. And again, you know, a two-way arms embargo, I mean, that's, that's really important. And, a, and I think something we should be campaigning hard on, but that's just one piece of a much bigger uh, 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 pie that we need to be uh, pushing towards in terms of ending Canadian complicity in, in, in Israel's genocide. And, and one thing in that, I'm just gonna maybe a little parentheses about the, the MPs not showing up at demonstrations. That's one of the things we need to start talking about. These NDP MPs who are wearing kafiyas in the House of Commons, good, I support that. Who are, you know, some of them like Matthew Green, Bulhis, uh, 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 Leah Gazan, uh, uh, Nikki Ashton. I believe they genuinely want to push the dial on this. They, this is this is real. It's not just the, you know, it's not just uh, mo going through the motions. This is, you know, generally held belief. Um, they got to be going to demonstrations. Why? Why wouldn't they be going to demonstrations? What, what is what is so odious about those opposing a Holocaust in Gaza that you can't associate with those actually taking to the street? You know, bearing minus ten weather in Montreal to hit the streets. What's so odious about those those people who are who are doing that? Um, so so that's one thing. That's in terms of pushing the dial. NDP MPs should be feeling pressure to, to get on uh, out onto the street if they actually oppose uh, uh, genocide. Now, back to the whole resolution in the House of Commons that was passed, the, there are some other things that were good in it. So for instance, the, the UNRWA funding, which the, they you know suspended and then reinstated, that's secured. So that is a step forward. It's not talked about much, that is a step forward. Um, the, the question of the ICJ and the ICC, International Court of Justice, International Criminal Court, that's also a step forward. There's a CBC article um, it, it, you know, it could be nothing. It's just like we, it just says we support ICJ and ICC around Israel. Now that actually goes quite against the, the Trudeau government's policy. The Trudeau government's been pressuring the ICC not to investigate Israel. The, the Trudeau government's been pressuring the ICJ, uh, not just around South Africa, but in the, the other case around the legality of the settlements and, and states' responsibility towards settlement products and the like. Um, so that actually is a, is, a, is a step in the right direction um, as well. Now, there's some business about sanctioning settlers in that motion. But as the Toronto Star pointed out um, a couple of days ago, uh, nearly two months after Trudeau and Jolie said Canada was sanctioned, quote, extremist Israeli settlers in the West Bank, the federal government has yet to provide answers on how or when plan it plans to do so. So again, they're playing this game. They announce these things that sound sort of good, and they do everything they can not to actually implement it. We see that with the arms very clearly. Uh, we see that with the uh, settler sanctions. Um, 
We probably see that with the ICJ and the ICC. That's their plan. It's on paper, but they don't really take it seriously. Um, but I still think in the if you look at the whole picture, the motion of the House of Commons, and it was a first ever, apparently first ever debate, uh, opposition day debating the Palestine resolution, uh, a Palestine resolution, uh, Palestine motion, should I say. So that in and of itself is interesting. And then the mobilization that basically prodded the NDP to take it more seriously and got some uh, liberal MPs to waver. Like it looked like there was actually going to be like potentially as many as 50 liberal MPs that were going to actually support um, the NDP resolution. Uh, that sort of uh, led to a kind of a, a rattling of the whole media political sphere, which I think was good. One of the fallouts uh, of this whole rep motion that's just beyond belief, like, is that the level of concern about Anthony Housefather, right? This this uber Jewish supremacist uh, liberal MP here in Montreal, Anthony Housefather um, immediately says he's talking about quitting the Liberal Party. And the front page of the Gazette is uh, Housefather is down but not out. Uh, CBC these long stories about how Anthony Housefather. What's Anthony Housefather going to do? Oh, he's been betrayed by the Liberal Party. Oh, Anthony Housefather. It's so hard to be Anthony Housefather. He doesn't know if he still has a home in the Liberal Party. It's disgusting. I mean, it's just disgusting. It's just the the other side to what IJV does with the centering of Jewish sensitivity. I mean, there is a, a Holocaust taking place in Gaza, and we're concerned about Anthony Housefather's feelings about whether he's going to run as an independent or as a liberal MP or as a conservative. It's just beyond uh, uh, beyond disgusting. Um, uh, and this is where uh, the political ethos is in this country at this time. Thomas Wacom, uh, who's like one of the you know most left-wing uh, columnists in a Canadian newspaper, Toronto Star, he has this piece about criticizing that the motion didn't, uh, it's titled, Canada should have recognized Palestine as a state. So that's what the liberals watered down, not recognizing Palestine as a state. That was the, the liberals' number one thing to, to water down in the motion. Um, in his piece, which you know I obviously agree with the broad ethos of what he's saying, he's criticizing the government, should be getting harder on Israel, whatever. He, he says, quote, this is ironic, given Canada's history in the region. For it was Canada's Lester Pearson who first gave voice in 1947 to what has become the UN orthodoxy, that of the two-state solution. So here he is mythologizing Lester Pearson until today, until the last five, six months, Lester Pearson did more than any Canadian politician to uh, dispossess, to kill Palestinians. And Wacom is depicting what happened in 47 as this like, you know, good thing. No, Lester Pearson screwed the Palestinians over at two different bodies of the UN and Canada's prison position in the partition plan, screwed Palestinians over. It enabled the ethnic cleansing of 47 and 48. Um, and But yet, here we are, lefty colonists uh, moralizing about this. Um, I've gone on too long, so I think I might skip a couple of things here. Um, Warren Kinsella uh, <laughs> asks, who's writing the checks for the anti-Israel protests? You're seeing this more and more. We're all getting paid uh, to, to you know hit the streets 25 weeks in a row. Uh, we get, you know, at the, we get a little check at the start of the demo. Uh, it comes directly from Qatar, apparently. Uh, um, sometimes it comes from the Hamas account or the Hezbollah account. Uh, it's just a joke. Warren Kinsella, of course, is like a, a, a paid consultant that is his whole career, you know, he makes a career of being paid by these political parties for all his different uh, uh, work. Um, and he's claiming that the people bearing the cold are, are on the pay. It's ridiculous. Um, but it speaks to how they need to figure out a way of of justifying why people will hit this, keep hitting the streets uh, against this these horrors that we're seeing. Um, the student union, the business student union at UCAM, Université de Québec à Montréal, passed a BDS resolution that makes all seven associations at UCAM have now passed BDS resolution for the first in any university in the country. Um, uh, I was going to show some images of, um, of uh, I, I confronted Mark Miller, uh, immigration minister, when I was in, in Ottawa for the launch of Canada's long fight against democracy on Thursday, which I should say went very well. It was a great event. Thanks to the Ottawa Peace Council for putting that on. Um, uh, the, the, I went down to Spark Street and I, I sat down at a, 
uh, that's the pedestrianized street where there's lots of parliamentary stuff. I sat down at the Tim Hortons. The Tim Hortons is right there. Got myself a, a window view and I did some work uh, hoping that I would see some like uh, politicians, ministers, whatever, walk by or some media officials. And just lo and behold, as I, as I purchased the coffee, I see this uh, in the kind of um, reflection in the mirror. I see, is that Mark Miller? And I wait a second and I see Mark Miller walking up uh, the street and I, I leave my bag and I exit the uh, the Tim Hortons and I and I uh, uh, challenge Miller on his recent uh, smear of McGill students uh, protesting their their um, university's uh, um, uh, agreements with with Israel and its funding of its f financing in, in military companies uh, uh, providing weapons to Israel. Um, I should say on the on the question of McGill, there the hunger strike now is over. Um, Three weeks. Uh, some people have been on full hunger strike. A, 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 a student, a woman, a young woman um, was hospitalized on Saturday uh, uh, from like, dehydration or, or whatever from her hunger strike. So this is real. There's 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 a, a number of going on kind of rotating hunger strike. But there's somebody who's been, I think it's over three weeks and somebody that's been pretty close to that. Um, and McGill's just refusing to even meet with them. Uh, on Saturday here, there was 5,000. It was very cold and snowy. And there were the unions and other social groups got behind a big Palestine demo, 5,000. I think if it would have been nicer weather, I think it probably would have been uh, a fair bit bigger, but it's still a good crowd, a solid crowd. And then the next day, there was 1,000 people on Sunday. So the mobilizations continue. Um, we went to the Greek Independence Day parade where Trudeau was there. I, I uh, challenged Melanie Jolie and, and, and some other people later on challenged Melanie Jolie. A bunch of people heckled uh, uh, Trudeau. Again, I was going to show the, the video of that. It's on my Twitter. People can check it out if they want. Um, I think I'm, I'm going to leave that because I don't got much time here. Um, but I think I'll leave it at that. The, the, the popular uprising continues. People keep mobilizing. It's amazing. It's inspiring. Uh, obviously, it's still not enough. We need to keep it going. Um, uh, but obviously, today, what happened in at the UN Security Council is a small step forward. A resolution passed calling for at least a short-term uh, ceasefire during Ramadan. Uh, the Americans finally didn't uh, didn't um, veto a resolution, uh, so that's good. Um, and if people have comments or questions, uh, go ahead. I see Yuri. I'm gonna. Uh, I think I've unmuted you, Yuri. I'm gonna try to find Laura and then um, go ahead. I'm gonna try to not go much past uh, seven o'clock if that's uh, if that's possible. I think I've unmuted you, Yuri. Uh, where am I? Hey, uh, can you hear me? I can. Okay, perfect. Sorry, I don't have my mic, so I hope it, so I hope everyone can hear me. But I just wanted to say, uh, oh my gosh, like I don't know, like there's there, there's I I completely agree with you, and and I feel your anger. I I I don't get why the left and and why and why even some of the best of the left do these bizarre own goals when it comes to all things israel palestine i mean uh what i i mean this 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 fake outrage over a satire on netanyahu it reminds me so much of um of the uh of the destruction of the Corbin project. I was a reporter for black agenda reports before I started one plus one. I see we, I, I, you know, spent a lot of time, you know, covering, and there was a uh, poster of, of Carlos Latouf, the great satirist who, who does a lot of work for men press news. It was a satire of Jeremy Corbyn giving a speech and him being bombed by uh, Netanyahu and a lot of and there's a and there was again like a lot of fake outrage over this is anti-Semitism. But Jeremy Corbyn himself, and this is not the first time he uh, he did this, but Jeremy Corbyn himself denounced the poster as anti-Semitic. <laughs> and like and, and again, like I don't get how how even the best of the left, especially those who 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 are who are great on Palestine justice, why why they do this to themselves and then and i just wanted just you know your response on the military i think the military is no longer allowed to investigate themselves when soldiers do uh sexual harassment or something like that i want your response on that yeah i mean i i agree i mean i think i to me <clears throat> it's been clear since the corbin stuff or before that even but the corbin stuff just solidified that that there has to be a strategy 
to deal with this. And, and like, even if you don't care about, like, if you just don't care about Palestinians, if you, even if it's just about the left, even if all, you know, if you're just, your issues are um, building economic democracy within Canada, uh, opposing the uh, climate uh, meltdown, uh, you know, uh, anti-racist, whatever. If, if even if you have Palestinians, you just, you just, I don't know, whatever, right? This is going to defeat us. If we don't have a strategy, the left collectively to respond to this stuff, this is because they, they made it absolutely crystal clear that, the, 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 you know, in the in the U.S., APAC's not just going against uh, pro-Palestinian Congress uh, people. They're trying to um, sabotage uh, anybody who's viewed as like a left wing. Uh, they're trying to primary, should I say, uh, anyone who's who's viewed as a left wing a uh, Democrat, uh, just because they know that the left-wing Democrats, they tend to get associated with a squad who in very, kind of ends up being kind of pro-Palestinian, just kind of gets pushed in that direction. So they want to kibosh any effort at like, like the left in general. So, I mean, to me, this is, we're way past that. To, and, and someone like Aaron Lakoff and the IJV people, they have, there's no, there's no room for like, oh, we made a mistake. We didn't understand. This isn't, this isn't new also, we should be clear. Like I, I personally, you know, when I, the event in, in Ottawa uh, that the uh, Palestinian Youth Movement organized, they asked me to speak at, that the University of Ottawa ended up uh, uh, shutting down that took place a bit later. I said, people in IJV tried to get me knocked off, right? People in IJV went to that PYM and said, don't dare have the, the uh, IPL, uh, I, I, uh, International League of People struggles and the PYM event, they tried to, they went to them and said, don't have Eve speak. Right. This is amidst this horror. And there's this like they're, 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 this is the people are focusing on this. This is this is come. This has gone way too far. There has to be pushback and enough of this stuff. Right. Like like they literally I mean, what does the threshold have to be like? What has to happen to Palestinians before you just say. Even if I view this as even if this scares me, even if it just scares me as a Canadian Jew, this depiction in a La Presse. Uh, cartoon, if this scares me that this is going to like unleash something, da, 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 da. something far worse is being unleashed right now. I mean, come on, right? Like there has to be some perspective on this stuff. And and clearly there's just, um, and, and you know, if and it, but it can't be talked about, right? And like, no one wants to talk about this stuff. And it, it, so it's all like kind of left under like this, this, this blanket of, and like I said, Larry Haven has this good piece pushing back against it. But again, he doesn't mention what I consider the main, like the, the most important point is that even if you do think this cartoon plays to some um, uh, anti-Jewish stereotypes, even if you believe that and he reinforces that, you believe that that supersedes getting into a corporate outlet, a pushback against the horrors in Gaza. I mean, that has, at some point you have to decide that that's the calculation. And to me, anybody who's a little bit pro-Palestinian, it doesn't even come close to reaching that reaching that threshold. Um, in terms of the military business, uh, I don't know exactly what's happened on that uh, about them, uh, the investigation stuff. I don't, I don't buy, you know, I think them, I mean, the military is obviously uh, structurally patriarchal right and and they can clean stuff up a little bit and they can they can uh put um the you know some of the troops a little bit on the back foot and probably dampen uh the rape and the sexual assaults and stuff like that um i i i'm i i'm skeptical that we're talking about something that that's that's going to be that uh significant probably a little bit of a step in the right direction um but um, not not uh, not very significant, and I I didn't follow exactly what's happened that closely. I, I Laura, I think I made you co-host. I thought I, I tried to make you host. Yeah, okay, can you hear me? Okay, go go ahead, Hans. So we can make this the last question. Is you need to go, Eve? Go ahead, Hans. Well, it's uh, more in the line of an announcement. Um. You know, we've had all these Zooms and everything like that. We very rarely get a chance to meet uh, ourselves in person. And tomorrow, 
at OISE at uh, the book launch for Eve's book, we have a chance uh, to meet him in person. And the meeting is at seven o'clock at the OISE, uh, Ontario Institute for Studies in Education. It's a very easily accessed location at the St. George subway. The room number is 2-214. So I hope to see as many of you as possible to welcome Eve and that fabulous book that he's launching yet again. See you tomorrow in thanks, person. Thanks, thanks, Hans. And I also should say that uh, Wednesday, Waterloo, and Thursday in Hamilton, and I'm just getting an event set up at the 20th in Kingston. And um, there's going to be one in Montreal uh, sometime in April. And uh, probably a bunch in the Vancouver, uh, Vancouver Island. And then hopefully in uh, June. And then hopefully from uh, Kelowna, uh, Calgary, uh, and uh, maybe in uh, Regina or Saskatoon. But I'm going to work on that. But yes, uh, thanks. Thanks, everyone. Um, same place, uh, same time uh, next week. Thanks, Steve. Thank you. See you.